Bula Vinaka Fiji and welcome to the State of the Fijian, a show where we look at the state and the Fijian like you and I and the politics that affects us all. 2014 was an important year for Fiji as we went to elections and people got the chance to vote for their own representatives. The 2014 elections introduced to us new faces and reintroduced old faces also. One of the new faces was the Vice President of the Fiji Law Society, the, president, the former President of the National Federation Party, Fiji's oldest political party, who went on to become an MP. She is now a leader of her own political party. Joining us today in studios is Mr. Tupodorin Dalo. Tupo, nice to have you with us. Thank you. How are you doing today? Good, thanks. You have had a, an interesting career. Mm. You have uh, been educated in Australia. Mm. Uh, you have been a former MP, you were president of Fiji's oldest political party, and now you have your own mm. uh, political party mm. where you're party leader. You were born into a family of chiefs mm. from the western and eastern sides of Fiji, mm. uh, a family that has been involved in the political history of mm. Fiji. How has it been, this political journey of yours? Mm. Interesting. <laughs> what does that mean, interesting? I mean, explain for us. I myself sometimes stop to think how interesting a life it's been so far, uh, in the sense that it hasn't been uneventful. Uneventful, you know, some people like uneventful. And to be very honest, sometimes when, you know, when there's a lot of uh, pressure and when there's a lot of uh, angst that comes my way, sometimes I wonder, I think I do, I might crave uneventful now. <laughs> How has it been, your, your, your parents have been part of Fiji's politics. Mm. How has been that learning journey? How has that contributed to your political life? Well, I, I learned from, because uh, I'm, I'm, I like to think I'm a good observer and listener. Mm. <laughs> and uh, to me, those are very important things. So I just take it in my stride, yeah. And I think in uh, traditional families, in Toke families particularly, you know, we are not pulled aside and taught the history of uh, mm. Rome, as it were. <laughs> you're supposed to observe and do as you And so you were one of those few women who, who, women who, did, uh, who went to parliament mm. after 2014. Eight years of military rule, women have been at some point forefront in trying to fight the mili militarism. Yes. You were one of them. You represented the deposed prime minister, Lesen Ngarase. Mm. In his court case, you are against coup. You have spoken out multiple times on the coup culture in Fiji. Mm. I want to talk about the fact that you are a woman politician. Mm. What has that journey been like? We, I was just part of a, a forum uh, a few days ago. We talked about the women experience in politics. Yeah. What has been your experience as a woman? Well, again, like I said, sometimes I do crave uneventful because I don't choose particularly easy paths. If I chose an easy path, my life would be very easy. You went on to become the president of the National Federation Party. That's correct. And that's <coughs> one of the oldest political, well, that's mm. the oldest the political oldest party political in Fiji. The oldest political party, yes. Uh, then you went on and resigned. Mm. But we're going to talk about the, that in a while. Mm. How was that journey? I, I really want to understand mm. how your political career has been. Well, I've said it before publicly, and that, that is what happened. I mean, the F National Federation Party and the Fiji Labour Party were a part of our home for a long time. Mm. But mind you, so was the Alliance Party from, you know, way young. Because uh, most of the, my family were in the Alliance Party, then there was the breakaway to the Labour Party. Uh, because, you know, there were differences of political opinion. Mm. That's all it was. Uh, you know, well, we'd like to think. <laughs> and now you yeah. are the only mm. female mm. leader of a political mm. party. We can't, we're nearing elections next year, yeah. sometime. Mm. What do you think about women's participation in politics in general? I think I'd like to encourage more women to participate. Um, I think we bring a different um, uh, perspective. Mm. And uh, if you see the most acrimonious things that happen, uh, they don't usually involve the women leaders. Mm -hmm. Although I certainly did my best to break out of that mold in terms of uh, being rather vociferous against the military and the coup culture. Mm. But I thought it was something that had to be done and I have no regrets. I, I do want to ask this though. Mm. Uh, you have been very vocal against certain members of parliament who are yeah. female mm. about how they campaign, how they are in their public life. And there's this very uh, interesting saying by Madeleine Albright, you know, a special place in hell yeah. for women who do not support other women. Yeah. I, I want to get your views. How is it that you are a woman MP, yeah. 
but there has been a lot of back and forth between you mm. and, for example, uh, Honorable Tambuya. I don't think there's been, I think there's just been one back and forth between us, and that mm -hmm. was prominent because, in fact, I was talking to her party leader then, Mr. Rambuka. Uh, she injected herself into the equation, mm -hmm. and uh, me believing in equal rights, why should I give her soft treatment because she's a woman? She will get equal treatment. I will give them the same, Rambuka and her. <laughs> and uh, how, how, what are your thoughts on the way that our female parliamentarians are being treated right now um, in, the, in the very beginning of the 2018 uh, first parliamentary sitting and afterwards there were comments about how certain female MPs were dressing within their political party outside of it uh, there were comments uh, recently of the Prime Minister uh, calling Honorable uh, Gerengere Tambua a beauty queen these we have a very low percentage of women who represent women in Parliament mm. and it does not seem that our current leadership is nurturing women to enter politics, it's making well, it harder for them. Yeah, thank you. I like that question. Uh, I don't think uh, that, you know, established politicians should should uh, give an easier time to people just because of their gender or whatever it is. I think, you know, politics has always been, uh, you know, a rough and tumble. And uh, I, as a woman, I don't want someone to patronize me hmm. and give me an easy time. And I certainly have not been patronized. You know, I've been given the baptism of fire like most people. Although I do get the occasional feedback that, no, you, you get very soft hands compared to what you've said because of traditional relations mm. and whatnot. Uh, I, I get that. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I don't, uh, I mean, I, nobody has ever said, talked to me about how I dressed. Mm. Or the Honorable uh, Rondrondro. And no one has ever mentioned, uh, you know, any of the, I don't know. I think... Uh, I don't know, you'll have to ask the people who make those comments, but I absolutely, that is just uh, nonsense to make any issue of how any politician dresses, especially women, if we're trying to encourage them. Who cares what they wear? We want to know what they think. Exactly. What's in their brain. <laughs> we are going to continue this conversation mm -hmm. with, uh, with Tupodra Indalo when we come after this break. Welcome back. We are on the state of the Fijian, talking to Ms. Tupo Ronindalo. Tupo, I want to ask, mm. social media, you've been yeah. very active on social media. <laughs> you yes. have uh, some controversial stuff on social media also. Mm. I want to talk about the role social media is playing in mm. Fijian politics right now. Mm. What are your views on that? Well, it's like uh, what it plays around the world. And we've seen... Uh, uh, what's come out of uh, the Senate hearings in Washington, hmm. where the whistleblower, and I've written about this in two articles in the Fiji Sun, um, that, you know, those sites uh, prefer to promote conflict and uh, have people tagging on to that because uh, that's how people get onto their platforms to see the fight, hmm. and uh, it sells ads. So. It can be, um, I mean, it should be used for the good, hmm. but unfortunately, you know, it's uh, something. Do you think, do you think our politicians are equipped to utilize social media? To be honest, I think uh, most politicians in Fiji, if not all, uh, relatively play good online. Mm -hmm. But uh, the problem is they're trolls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're trolls who are influenced to do other things. And I've had a lot of experience with a few of them you know, who come up and just say the most baseless things. And I'm not one to be known as a doormat or to take things lying mm. down. So, of course, I'll respond, which is silly. I shouldn't respond. Uh, and you, I've you, you have also been, you know, uh, accused of blocking people on, oh, yes. on social media. That, that is one of, my, uh, accessibility. one of my favorite things to do uh, because I, d I don't want to be engaging with uh, people who are not engaging their brain. But don't you think <laughs> it's important as someone who's asking people to vote for them to know what your values are? to actually be accessible to the public. Except there are people that come on to antagonize. They deliberately come on to antagonize yeah. and to uh, skewer the message. Hmm. You know, as far as I'm concerned, the messages I'm trying to get out are very important. Hmm. Some will say that it's very highbrow, but that's okay. I want the level of our discussion to be at a high level. Hmm. When people come in at a low level, I, thankfully, I've gone to the mute button now. I've discovered it instead of going to the block button. Yeah. So it works out very well. Yeah. I, I, I want to play something. This is a good segue. I want to play something that uh, Honorable Gerengere Tambua said mm. at the Women's in For uh, Politics Forum mm. uh, a few days ago. Yeah. Uh, let's have a listen on what she said. 
when voters don't have much information about the candidates beyond the basic information like gender, they are more likely to rely on, their st on stereotypes. Several studies have even suggested that voters who make their choice with little or outside knowledge are more likely to support a man. So how does one counter this? I reckon, be more visible. So she said this in the context of women uh, politicians and men politicians, mm. but she talks about, talks about visibility. And I'm picking this up from social media chatter about how politicians, one, do not know how to use social media mm. and how they block accessibility yeah. to individuals to understand what the values of mm. politicians are. And uh, I'm, I'm asking again, yeah. are politicians equipped to understand how social media can influence their campaigns? In Fiji. I'm sure I'm, I'm sure reading from other politicians that they know how it is that they need to engage but I think I certainly do it but I've seen others take it on uh, they just mute people uh, you know block is the worst you know it's like this that's the option you just don't want to deal with mm. but they mute people if they don't want to engage at that level mm. and like I've said Abdul one of the big problems overseas uh, with social media uh, misinformation is because we're giving platform and you know there are some views that we don't need to hear mm. you know there are views of racism antagonism and trying to get people to fight against each other we don't want to entertain those views mm. we want to talk about policy things that are important to improve people's lives we want to keep the discussion at that level mm. and uh, in terms of visibility no I absolutely agree with what the Honorable Gengar Tumbo has said but I think in my case, uh, I don't find that an issue. When I go mm. out, people, because you know, I've got ultra exposure before from whatever posts I used to have. Uh, but of course, there has been a lot of min misinformation I've noticed uh, in the last elections that the, the parties, uh, we joked about this in the whole party, that mm. at one stage, it seemed like the opposition parties hated hope more than they did Fiji First. Oh, how was that? with the kinds of things that their trolls said online okay. and in person, wherever we went, we would get this feedback and we was like, well, you know, <laughs> but we wear it as we wore it and I still do, wear it as a badge of honor that the other non-government parties uh, would dislike us more than they dislike Fiji first. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to move on to the next uh, policy question that mm. we have got. Um, I'm quoting from Radio New Zealand, which uh, quoted uh, John Epted, a prominent Fiji lawyer, who said the issue during the COVID-19 pandemic was how far in once and in what circumstances the requirement for a person to be vaccinated as a condition of some benefit could be imposed by a state, an employer, school or public persons like a retailer or shop. This is, of course, with regards to COVID-19 and government's no jab, no job policy, mm -hmm. which has raised a few eyebrows. There have been, a, I think, a few court cases. What would a hope party initiative be at this mm. point if if hope was in government mm. what would you have done as we try to open up fiji mm. do an economic recovery initiative well we i mean i've all, i've been agreeing with what the government has been doing in terms of uh, the way they've dealt with covid 19 and we've seen that the bigger countries with more money more hospitals and they've got endless amount of supply of money to bring all sorts of medical equipment and whatever that mm. they need Australia and New Zealand, our closest. Mm. What happened here is exactly what transpired in New South Wales mm. and then later in New Zealand. Yeah. And just two days ago, I think, or yesterday, uh, the Prime Minister of New Zealand was asked, uh, are you something along the lines where are you, you're talking as though there are two classes of people now in New Zealand, mm. those who are vaccinated and those who aren't. And those who are vaccinated get in cer certain privileges and those who are unvaccinated, is that what? And in fact, the person asking, the journalist, was sort of trying to um, make it out that that's not exactly what she was saying. And, but she said, yep, that's exactly what I'm saying. So, you know... So how do, how do we deal with people who don't believe in the vaccine or they're mm. vaccine, anti-vaxxers or they're hesitating mm. to get the vaccine because of some valid concern? How of do we deal course. with that? Well, the experts have put out uh, various step-by-step -step measures on mm. how to convince them. Yeah. Uh, one prominent amongst that is not to talk down mm. to people. Uh, so that's not something I'm going to be qualified for. Yeah. <laughs> there are experts to do this. And mm. I think government should run those programs and try and convince and get everybody. But if you see our vaccination rates, very impressive. I'm very impressed with Fijians. Mm. Um, uh, there was lots of talk, and you got involved in this on Twitter, about how government is not doing a lockdown. Mm. Uh, and government went on to say, oh, it's, it's something that the elites would say. But then, because you know people are not able to walk, 
uh, but then people are still in lockdown. They aren't able to go to work. The people who need that uh, money, uh, people who are doing, you know, uh, manual labor, mm. they aren't able. They weren't able to go to work. There were there was evidence to suggest that had we gone into a hard lockdown, we may have come to an end of this uh, second wave faster. What are your opinions on that? Well, again, Abdul, I'll just, uh, I would like Fijians to look at what happened in New South Wales and take it from there. New mm. South Wales, the economy, I think, is more than 10 times bigger than Fiji, mm. maybe 100 times bigger than Fiji, billions and billions of dollars. Uh, but their lockdown was, uh, their, what they called a hard lockdown was softer than ours. Yeah. I was, you know, <laughs> ours was pretty harsh, you know, it was pretty harsh. I mean, the, I mean we had curfews for... A long time. What was it? 8 p.m.? Yep. Yeah. From, starting from 8. For a long time. 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. Yeah. When we were kept hostages in our own homes. I mean, if that's not hard lockdown, I don't know what is. But, you know, like yep. I said, countries like Australia that and New South Wales, the richest economy in Australia, if they they can have, uh, you know, lockdowns, and why, we should be very grateful at how our government dealt yeah. with ours. Yeah. We're going to return after this break to talk more on COVID and other issues that affect us as Fijians. Welcome back. You are on the state of the Fijian and we're talking to Mr. Pod Dalo. I'm going to continue asking on COVID. One of the issues that have come up a lot is about Fiji Airways and the Fijian government bailing out the airline. Uh, recently, I think in the last parliament sitting, uh, it was revealed that the Fijian government now has a 75% stake. The National Federation Party, I've seen a post by Nikona Kula, which has said, we need to let go of the airline. We cannot be putting so much of taxpayer money into that. What would a hope government, what would be the hope government's uh, outlook on this? I think it's important to have a national airline, uh, especially when we have a lot invested in tourism. Hmm. Uh, if we invest so much in resorts and all of that, then why are we going to give up the airline? The two go together. Hmm. And I'm very confused about with these non-government uh, parties who are attacking Fiji Airways and the guarantees that they are given. Mm. On one hand, they want the sacked workers to go back immediately. Mm. On another hand, they want the company to be let go. Mm. So, Abdul, before I address the issue substantially, first you must ask them to make up their mind. Um, moving on, mm. I want to ask a little bit about youth in politics. Do you see yourself as a new generation of young politician? You're fairly new. I, I, I understand you t contested the election in yes. 2000, but you came into parliament in 2014, uh, just after yeah. we, after our military government, yes. you know? Well, I, I'm happy people consider me to be new, uh, but one of the things that we laugh about uh, with my friends and colleagues is uh, how in Fiji, uh, you know, the leaders are still in their 70s and 80s. We don't mm. want to be ageist, <laughs> but we, we tell each other, look, we're still young because we are in our late 40s or mm. mid 40s. So hooray to that. But, you know, come on. We've, you know, right now I'm always trying to encourage the 20 year olds and 30 year olds. I mean, that's what happens overseas. Mm. And we should have it here because why should the people who are 20s and 30s, why should they vote for people who are in the late 40s and 50s as the young? You know, we, what I might find acceptable, mm. you know, people in their 20s and 30s may be rolling their eyes and thinking I'm a dinosaur. Yeah. So, so, so what more can be done to have more young, young people in politics? I think it's always been about leadership. Mm -hmm. It's up to the political party leaders. Mm. If they go out and find those candidates, uh, they will be able to put young people in. Yeah. But uh, from my experience, not just uh, the whole party, but in other uh, parties that I've observed over the years, uh, they they attract young people, but they put them down the list. Hmm. Yeah. Well, whereas we should yet, if we attract young people, and we are fortunate to get young people who are substantive hmm. and can stand up in parliament, and fight for the issues we want them to fight for, we should put them up the list. Yeah. And and you know we talk a lot about political parties needing to have that will. Hmm. But I, as a young person, I'm asking, do you think our government should have that political will? Forty, seventy percent or sixty yes. percent of our population are under forty. Yeah. But we don't have things like temporary special measures. We talk about yeah. young people in politics, yeah. but we really are just talking about it. Mm. Literally, we have no policies in place mm. which says we will have young people at the table mm. by putting TSMs. Yeah. What would a hope party, uh, would a hope government mm. look at TSMs as a possibility for y young people, mm. people with disability, for women? Mm. 
I, I would uh, prefer that the parties do it hmm. and some political parties, but I have never had that problem. But there's nothing binding, to, isn't it? Uh, it's not binding, but I can appeal directly uh, to the leader of the opposition and to the leader of government. If you want young people to participate uh, more in the next elections and have a say and stand up in parliament, please put 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds who qualify into your party, onto your list, please put them up the list. I challenge you to put uh, five in that category in your top ten. Uh, that would be great. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Young people are listening. I, so we have this segment in our show where we ask you questions from the public. Yeah. So these are not our questions. We have reached out to a few young people. We have reached out to a few Fijians to say, what do you want to ask Mr. Podorindalo? I'm going to play you a video by Rakeen, who's a young person. Let's hear what question he has for you. Hello, Mr. Po. What are the three things uh, the Hope Party will do differently if chosen in the next election? So what are the three things, three priorities of a Hope government mm. if they were to come in in the next election? We talked about this at the last election and we remain with it and that's the wages, mm -hmm. um, improving the wages in this country. What the, would it look like? We stick with a up to $10 minimum wage, mm -hmm. uh, sector by sector, consultations, mm. no false line. Yeah. Uh, the second big issue we think is education. We really want to tackle the streams of education. Mm. We want our education system to cater from Form 5, Form 5, 6 and 7. Students, Fijian students should be able to choose which big stream they fall into. If they yeah. want academia, they go to academia. If mm. they want vocation and arts, they go in there. Mm -hmm. And if they want to concentrate on sports, they go on that stream. Mm. All three can do amazing things for our economy. But mm. as it is, we are focusing only on academia, mm. which is okay for maybe students like me, although I think I had a more artistic flair mm. and I was forced into academia <laughs> by our education system. Uh, but. You know, we've seen all around the world what Fijian sports people and what Fijian artists can do. Mm. And in Australia, there was a report, I wish I had brought that along with me, the amount of money that the arts earns for the Australian economy. Right. I think we are, we are really letting down a big segment of our people uh, mm. by not catering to their talents. Yeah. What would yeah. be the third priority? Third priority, good question. Um, the private sector is something uh, we've always... Uh, talked a lot about mm. and in the last elections we talked about uh, the private sector being the um, development partner of government right and I've said in uh, a show that we did online mm. uh, that the biggest thing that uh, the private sector does not like is red tape mm. that's not to say that uh, government regulation will pull back completely mm. but you know I, I see this government is doing its bit uh, on from on from the last elections they've really gone out to give incentives and all of that mm. We will also uh, do more for the private sector along those lines because we want to encourage uh, economic growth. Uh, that's for okay. all Fijians. Okay. I'm going to play another clip. Mm. This is by La Serusa Seru, and this is their question. There is a rise in sexual and gender-based violence in Fiji towards women, children, and the LGBT community. What steps would hope government take towards this issue? Sexual and gender-based violence towards women, children, and the LGBT community. Priorities to combat this it's by a, Hope government. It's a real blot, isn't it? Uh, what we're seeing from the DPP uh, almost every month, I think they give a report. Uh, again, uh, as we said at the last elections and something which we will still go with, uh, we, we prefer, first of all, generally, we would like uh, a think tank part of government mm. to do research and development. And this area... We would like the experts. We don't want to come in with uh, half-baked ideas. Uh, we prefer to rely on the experts who have done the studies. And there are lots of NGOs in this country, and quite a few do important work in this area. Right. And I'm sure they have policy ideas that they think can help improve you know, uh, the situation if government worked with them on the issue. And that's what we will do. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to just quickly ask the last question. And this would be, again, from uh, the public. It was sent to us via social media. And yep. We have seen three political parties uh, talk about merging. Is there hope for hope to merge? To merge, sorry. Uh, we'll take it as it comes. Uh, but if you see, like we said again at the last elections, if you listen to all of us, there were really three big points of view at the last election. Mm -hmm. Fiji First had its point of view. Mm -hmm. The other non-government parties, they all agreed on everything. 
they signed statements together, they sat together, gave press conferences together, so they were the second view. Hmm. Ours was the third view. Right. Now, if we have those three large groupings, the stage will not be crowded. So I would really urge uh, the other non-government parties who are you know, still uh, trying to pretend that they're here, there, or whatever, just get together, please. You are one point of view. Make it easier for me. <laughs> you are not our point of view and you are not Fiji First point of view. Okay, that was a very short and good conversation on the state and the Fijian. Mr. Indalo, thank you for thank joining you. us. We will see you next time when we return with our, another guest to talk about the state and the Fijian. Until then, be safe, have a good night, see you.